The presidents of Nicaragua and Iran announced on Wednesday the signing of important agreements between the two nations. Russian President Biden put in met with the Cuban Prime Minister Manuel Marrero Cruz as part of the official visit of the Latin American high official to Russia. And at least 106 people have been reported dead in one of Nigeria's deadliest riverboat accidents in years. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Sur Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. The presidents of Nicaragua and Iran announced on Wednesday the signing of important agreements between the two nations. The announcement was made at a press conference held by both leaders in Managua during the official visit by Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi to the Central American country. President Ortega informed that three memorandums of strategic importance for both nations had been signed. According to Nicaragua's Vice President Rosario Murillo, the agreements provide greater opportunities for fraternal development, solidarity and social justice based precisely on scientific and technical cooperation. The Nicaraguan President talked about the will that both countries have to talk about topics of interest. We are here and uh, it is very clear within these subjects that, that there is the will, there is the will to, to talk about the subjects that are already, uh, already deal with. The Nicaraguan person also thanked the Iranian head of state for his solidarity with the peoples of Venezuela, Cuba and Nicaragua. And you? You in this occasion have come here to express your solidarity towards, towards the people, towards these brave, towards these brave people as Venezuelan people, the people of Bolivar, the people, the Cuban people, the people, uh, the people of uh, Martí, Fidel, Raúl, and now with the president Miguel Díaz Canel in. And the Nicaraguan people. Thanks, dear president. Thanks to your people. Thanks to your brave people. Thanks to to his to his people. Moreover, President Daniel Ortega stated that the visit of Ibrahim Raisi is a visit that moves the hearts of the peoples of Latin America and the Caribbean. As I was saying, as I was saying yesterday, we, we recognized your visit as a visit that will, that is, as a visit that uh, is, is very moving to the most committed people in fighting, in the fight, in the fight for sovereignty and integration of Latin America and the Caribbean. During the press conference, the president of Iran, Ibrahim Raisi, said that the resilience of the people has had a significant importance. There have been military interventions and as well the threats, the threats, the sanctions are their measures, are the measures that they use in order to pressure the sanctions. But, but the persistence, but the persistence of the people and the search for, search for independence, for freedom, neutralizes, neutralizes amazing stop and setback. The Iranian president also mentioned some of the areas of cooperation in which they can exchange. We have made uh, big steps in uh, Iran regarding health. We have we have excellent experiences regarding this. And we have we have personnel. We have very we have person with a great expertise in the subjects, especially in the pharmaceutical issue area. Um, we believe that this would be one of the areas in which we 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 should have good cooperations and interchange with you. 
In Ecuador, residents of the province of Esmeraldas affected by the rains traveled to Quito to demand the attention of the central government. The farmers' communities of Esmeraldas denounced on Wednesday the neglect on the part of the national government and local authorities. Farmer leaders indicated that they were not received by the Minister of Transportation, to whom they asked for a solution to the situation. Those affected claim by the rains claimed that their commitment to repair the damage caused by the rains has not been fulfilled. Citizens warned that the deterioration of the roads in the farmer communities makes shipping and the production of fish and vegetables difficult. We have come here to demand the government, to demand the Minister of Public Works to attend to the destruction that exists on the Tonchingue Galera Kinga San Francisco Road, which is totally collapsed and does not allow the population to live. Four days ago, we have the death of a 13 year old boy due to dengue fever who couldn't live because we have nowhere to go out. That is what we have come to denounce, to visualize, but unfortunately, we are living without any answer. In Ecuador, the president of the unions of farmers' organizations of the province of Esmeraldas, Nancy Beron, pointed out that the roads destroyed by the rain generate roadblocks that cut access to healthcare services and stop fishing and agricultural production. The damaged roads, the collapsed bridges, mean first that we can go out for medical emergencies, that is, we can die. Second, we can get our production out, the fishermen can get their production out, the farmers can get their production out. The tourism activity where we women live, we do a little community tourism to make ends meet, is also affected. We don't have access to doctors, to health centers, to teachers, to schools. That is, we are totally abandoned. Let's take a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesur English, where you will find news in different formats, news updates, and much more. All the stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back from the South. Russian President Vladimir Putin met on Wednesday with Cuban Prime Minister Manuel Mahoro Cruz. The meeting took place in Moscow as part of the official visit of the Latin American high official to Russia. During the meeting, Putin and Mahoro Cruz talked about bilateral relations as well as economic and humanitarian cooperation. The Russian leaders stressed that relations between Moscow and Havana are developing despite the complexities of the current situation. Moreover, Putin affirmed that the Russian side will do everything possible to help Cuba overcome the illegal sanctions imposed by the West against the island. For his part, Mahoro Cruz pointed out that his country maintains a firm stance against the West's unilateral sanctions, as well as against its attempts to isolate Russia from international organizations and to try to sow a kind of Russophobia. Also on Wednesday, the President of the State Duma or Lower House of Russian Parliament, Vyacheslav Volodin, ratified that to the Prime Minister of Cuba, Manuel Marrero, the unconditional support of the legislative body to the Caribbean nation. At the meeting, Volodin ratified that the deputies of the Eurasian giant, regardless of their political positions, are opposed to the pressure of sanctions on sovereign nations orchestrated from the West. Regarding the strengthening of cooperation between Havana and Moscow, Bolonia stressed that it is based on the active work of the heads of state, Vladimir Putin and Miguel Díaz-Canel. The 26th International Economic Forum, SPF, opened on Wednesday in the Russian city of St. Petersburg and will run until June 17th, with the participation of delegations from more than 100 countries from all over the world. This year, the main theme of the forum is Sovereign Development, the basis of a just world, let us join forces for the sake of future generations. According to Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov, its central event, as is traditional, will be the plenary session which will be attended by Russian President Vladimir Putin. Interest in the forum is growing despite attempts by the West to isolate Moscow. Traditionally, SPF companies do not only sign deals but also attract the attention of attendees with original projects at their stands. Also, the forum features an exhibition of new drone models and multiple exhibits showcasing Russian culture and the country's characteristic features. 
The president of Honduras, Yomara Castro, is on a six-day state visit to China. Besides signing several agreements with the Asian country and meeting the Chinese president, the Central American head of state met the president of the New Development Bank, Dilma Rousseff. The details direct from Beijing with journalist Mauro Ramos. For the first time in history, a president of Honduras traveled to the People's Republic of China. The state visit came less than three months after the two countries established diplomatic relations. Honduras broke off diplomatic relations with Taiwan and recognized the existence of a single China in March this year, reducing to 13 the number of countries that have no relations with the Asian country. During the visit, the Honduran government confirmed its willingness to join the new Silk Road and Economic Integration and Development Initiative launched 10 years ago by Chinese President Xi Jinping. The two governments also reached a consensus to start negotiating a free trade agreement. I appreciate this historic opening of relations with the People's Republic of China and its People's President of Honduras. I recognize only one China that led by President Xi Jinping. Its progress and the development of its people, as well as the leadership in the world, promoting the initiative we have adapted. Aware of the great challenges to reduce asymmetries and build peace, so necessary to redefine the course of humanity. Me gustaría darle la más cordial de las bienvenidas. Usted ha cumplido resueltamente su promesa electoral. I would like to extend a warm welcome to you. You have resolutely fulfilled your election promise to establish diplomatic relations with China, taking a historic decision that demonstrates strong political will. Your husband, former President Mr. Zelaya, also played an active role in this regard, something I greatly appreciate. History will remember your contribution to China-Honduras relations. In 2008, the year before the coup d'etat in Honduras, the President Manuel Zelaya had expressed the possibility that his country would establish diplomatic relations with China. At that time, Costa Rica was the only Central American country that had adhered to the One China principle. During this tour, both governments signed 17 agreements, including several protocols to facilitate Honduran agricultural exports, especially coffee. Honduras is the fifth largest coffee producer and exporter in the world. According to the Honduran Coffee Institute, small producers growing coffee on farms of up to 5 hectares account for 95% of the total. In 2021, China became the 16th largest importer of coffee in the world, $497 billion in coffee imports. This could change Hondurans, giving them an opportunity to position themselves in the Asian continent. In the first part of the state visit to China, Simara Castro met with the president of the New Development Bank, Dilma Rousseff, and formally requested Honduras' entry to the banking entity. In a visit to the Tiananmen Tower, the president of Honduras remembered journalist and activist Ramon Amaya Amador, a member of the now defunct Communist Party of Honduras. Amaya Amador was the first Honduran to visit the People's Republic of China in 1952. Desde Pekín en China, de la TVT de Brasil para Telesur, Mauro Ramos. Telesur English continues to grow. You can now tune in from 33 different African countries through Starsat, Dow 461 and enjoy Latin American alternative broadcasts. One final short break, I'll be right back. Don't go away. were killed and one wounded in a shooting incident at a Japanese army firing range in central Japan. 
According to authorities, the tragedy was allegedly provoked by a new recruit who they confirm is in custody. The report from the Ground Self-Defense Force indicated that during a live ammunition exercise as part of new personnel training, a self-defense force trainee shot three people, leaving two soldiers dead. The alleged assailant is an 18-year-old new recruit who joined the Army in April, said Yasunori Morishita, commander of the Ground Self-Defense Force. Morishita pointed out that, to his knowledge, the previous incident of gun violence by a member of the Ground Self-Defense Force dated back to 1984. On Wednesday, the death toll from a Nigeria rural disaster rose to 106 people as rescue teams searched for more survivors after one of the country's deadliest waterway accidents in years. The boat, carrying around 250 passengers traveling from a wedding ceremony, capsized in the early hours of Monday, June 12, in north-central Kuala State, police and local officials said. The accident was the latest boating tragedy in Nigeria, where river capsizes are common due to overloading, poor safety and heavy flooding in the rainy season. More than half the victims came from the Ebu village and another 38 were from nearby Sakan village. It is indeed very unfortunate that over 100 lives were lost. The incident was very sad and it shocked the whole community. It affected almost everyone because the disease touched loved ones, families, friends and colleagues, so it must affect them in one way or another. The causes of such incidents are many, but the main causes are machinery failures, overloading, carrying wood, the operators in attention, the weather, among other things. The government of Egypt has applied to become a member of the BRICS group comprising Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. According to the Russian ambassador in Cairo, Gyorgy Borisanko, the request was issued given that one of the initiatives currently being carried out by the BRICS is to convert trade to alternative currencies as far as possible, whether they be national currencies or the creation of some kind of common currency. The official explained that Eve is interested in such an initiative with a view to reducing its demand for dollars. In February, Egypt's parliament approved a presidential decree ratifying an agreement allowing the country to join the BRICS new development bank. Lebanese lawmakers failed on Wednesday for the 12th time in their attempt to elect a new president. Lebanon has been without a head of state for seven months and the previous attempt to elect a president was on January 19th. The vote for president had the candidates Sleiman Frangie, backed by Hezbollah, and Jihad Azur, with the majority support of Christian and independent lawmakers. Azur, Azur won 59 votes, and Frangie a total of 51 votes in the 128-seat parliament. To be elected president, the winning candidate must obtain at least 65 votes. Parliament Speaker Nabi Berry, in a statement after the session, agreed that only consensus and dialogue will expedite the election of a president. So far, there is no date foreseen for a new vote. South Africa's National Assembly has passed a controversial bill to introduce universal health coverage in the country. The nation's health minister, Joe Fala, hailed the bill's approval as a historic step for the le legislation that had been in the pipeline for 12 years. However, the opposition fears that the already overburdened public health system will collapse if the new legislation comes into force. The leading opposition party, the Democratic Alliance, denounced the move saying that 9 million of the 60 million South Africans who have medical insurance would have to be covered by an already overburdened public health system. South African public hospitals are often overcrowded and under-resourced or understaffed. The most privileged often turn to the private sector. And every June 14th, Cuba and the world commemorate the birth of Ernesto Che Guevara, one of the symbols of the progressive and anti-imperialist ideals in Latin America. Born in Argentina on June 14, 1925, Ernesto Guevara de la Serna, universally known just as Che, was an Argentinian-Cuban revolutionary fighter, statesman, writer, and medical doctor. Che Guevara was part of the expedition of the Grand Majac, led by Fidel Castro, that began the armed struggle against the dictatorship of Fulgencio Batista in Cuba. During this period, he earned the rank of commander, and after the revolutionary triumph, Che was appointed president of Cuba's National Bank and Minister of Industries. Following his, following his ideals of bringing freedom and justice to oppressed peoples, in 1965 he led guerrillas in the Congo 
and in Bolivia, where he was taken prisoner by local troops in the Euro Ravine and assassinated the day after his capture. His remains were located in 1997 and sent to Cuba, where they were laid to rest in the Commandante Ernesto Che Guevara Memorial Complex, built to honor his life and legacy. We have come to the end of this news bedroom. You can find these and many other stories on our website, tresorenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Tresor English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.